I do kind of get tired of moving so much that I do want to make roots. And I feel like Peoria is perfect. Mic check, mic check, mic check. What's going on? It's the all new KZ123. No more for throwbacks. I'm Ross Martinez, your host for the KZ Community Beat. In the hot seat this week, I have Brett Brooks, senior reporter at WEEK25 News, Illinois State Director of Miss Illinois Earth Beauty Pageant, author and podcast host of Pageants and Prosecco, and the owner of B Square Productions LLC. And hold on, let me catch my breath. Social media superstar Brett. Hey, what's going on? I don't know how you got time to be here because you have about twenty five things. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you. Oh, I make time for you. Oh, I appreciate. It. We're friends now. I like that. So we moved here about the same time last year, huh? Yes, we did. Um, last May is when I got to Peoria, and I've had a blast ever since. It's my one year anniversary. Well, I guess it was May sixteenth. Oh, nice. Of so, me starting work at the TV station. Did we both find this on accident? Let's just be honest. Like, I've, I'm i not going to lie to you, B. Like, I found out about Peoria when I got the job here. Really? Yo, I'm south side of Chicago, and I had no idea. So, I lived in pretty much all the small towns in Illinois that you can name. I went to Eastern Illinois University. It's in Charleston, south of Champaign. And then I went to Decatur shortly after for my first job in TV as a producer. I lived in Springfield, Illinois for my master's degree at the U of I. And I lived in Rockford, Illinois for my next job on TV as a reporter. <laughs> now I'm in Peoria. You see the face I'm giving you right now? Like, yeah. why? So how how do you find time to do all this stuff? The grace of God. Honestly, the grace <laughs> of God. I don't know. It all kind of builds on top of each other. I just got the LLC from my production company in February. Congrats. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And my production company, was I was already doing a lot of things creatively. But I was paying out of pocket, and there was no separation of my money and the money coming in from my businesses. So I decided to get the LLC. The pageants came about because I competed in pageants all my life. I think I'm just a creative person. I started doing a lot of creativity. I think with the, I was in fourth grade when I did my first play. So a lot of me is creative. I started off in theater, and then I went behind the camera, and that's kind of where I found my sweet spot was behind the camera. So that's kind of pretty much everything I do is a branch of being a creative person. Behind the camera, but you're a senior reporter at WEK, which I've made a mistake multiple times on radio and called you on week 25. My <laughs> boss pulled me in the office. He's like, really? I was like, I'm an outsider, dude. I don't know. So it's WEEK. It's WEEK, yes. Any other TV station, you would say the call letters. If it was WGN mm -hmm. or ABC7, you would say WLS. You want to say Willis. Yeah, you know, I, yeah, I learned that well, was it's W E E K, but we are kind of curse. Yeah, we are not no weak ass reporters. Ooh, That's our like slogan. You know, for real? Is that like the official slogan? No, we're your home team. Oh, uh, but but in your heart, we are not no weak reporters. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I, I use a lot of what you guys put on your website to talk about local things. So I'm always watching whatever you guys are posting and putting on uh, your your There's website. There's an air of excellence at our station, so thank you. No, I like it. You guys are always on top of it. Yes. And it, oh, when we're number dog. one, you have to be number one. So how does it feel just coming into Peoria? And it kind of seems like you've almost been like symbiotic with the brand. You think so? Well, I see you everywhere I go. Like, at events, I'll see you pop up with the camera. You're just recording, and then you interview, <laughs> and then you're on to the next gig. So yeah. when I think w or W25, or Week 25, I'm like, whoa, that's B. Brooks. Oh, thank you. But I feel like a lot of people think that, too. Oh, really? That's an honor to know, because I just got here, um, and I really feel like I shook the area. I think that it's just more so when you put out good work and when you're truly passionate. Like, I really try to go to the community whether or not I'm on the clock or not. I try to go into the community because that, for me, is how I'm uh, able to understand what's happening, hear the conversation and the dialogue about what people are talking about, and then get the stories for next week and then cultivate sources. But also, I'm just, I'm a Sagittarius like you are. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like we like to travel and be outside. I can't really sit in the house for too long. Um, so I, I just like to just go out and meet new people generally. But do you find yourself, because I do this, I recluse myself to my place. Like this weekend, uh, was it Memorial Day weekend? Is it Memorial yeah, it was, yeah. I literally did nothing but change my layout around and just recharge my entire pill. Do you find yourself, because of everything you do, like the 15-second intro right here, like <laughs> all the hats you wear, all the events you try to go to, how you try to establish yourself in the community, do you find yourself getting burnt out a lot? I do. I do. I do have to recharge. I didn't go out at all this weekend either. Um, <laughs> You're a hermit like me? Yes. Nice. And I love a nice bath. I'll probably be in a bath for probably like three hours. <laughs> Not going to lie to you. 
That's how I recharge. Do you light the candles, everything, and put the good yes. music on? Yes, I do. Yes, I, <laughs> I, I actually do. Sometimes I listen to YouTube. Um, I'm trying to learn or read a book or I'll journal or I have my, I have my wine. It's a whole situation going on. So <laughs> Glamour. That's, that's, yeah, that's how I recharge. So, yeah, I do have to take a break. But now because the pageants, both pageants are coming up, it's, I know that after July 16th is when I can kind of slow down. So this is like your busy time. Yeah, this is my busy time. So have you always been like this? Like who instilled this type of work, work ethic in you? I think so, yeah. I was. Um, I think I've always sought off leadership positions. In high school, I was class president all four years of high school, which involves you know elections and campaigning. And uh, in college, I was the floor president of the girls' floor. I was um, – <laughs> actually, it's funny. So it was twin towers, um, a guy tower and a girl tower. And we all had floors. So it was 12 floors. So I was in charge of the ninth floor. And we literally shut the ninth floor down and all the fun things. We haven't. What's it, towers? It's like the two. It's two different buildings on campus. Oh, okay. So I always thought of leadership. I said it because I was always interested in leadership positions. I was a student senator in college as well. So I kind of just always naturally just looked for leadership positions and just moved accordingly. Hmm. So who was like the big inspiration to see that type of work out there? Because like from my... For me, it was my mom and dad. Like, my mom would always be on a laptop even after making dinner. My pops, he'll come home greased up for a quick lunch, go right back out. Eight o'clock at night, he left at six in the morning. Like, they're workaholics in a way. I, I, I would say, I think it started out of, honestly, it probably started out of trauma because Ooh. in high school, um, naturally, my mom and I were both very strong women and me growing into my own. So I used to do a lot of things in high school to stay there as long as I could to avoid kind of going home. So I did theater, and theater was a very long process, especially leading up to the show. And so I wouldn't leave high school till like, 10 o'clock at night sometimes. And then I'll have to be back at, like, 7 a.m. for rehearsal. So I think naturally, and then I did track also and student council. So I think naturally it was just wanting to just stay busy so I can avoid going home. Hmm. No, I mean, <laughs> you found the creative outlet to – better yourself but at the same time kind of distract yourself from everything going on whatever it is we don't have to talk about it yeah but it's kind of amazing how the human mind can find distractions That's productively true. in a way because mm -hmm. so many times we do see the other end of it where you know you go a different route so you yeah. had this natural fire to just be productive be you busy. want to be yes. better yes and i think that whenever i saw a position available like in high school i was always kind of drawn to stepping up in a way i couldn't tell you really why but i was always felt like oh i could do that oh i could do that i remember i ran for pres for class president in fifth grade just because it was an option and i lost and i cried like a baby says guy named alex alex he is not a friend of the pod <laughs> <laughs> guy named alex so i kind of always sought a leadership position that's interesting because like for me and my trauma I try to be the funny one, the entertaining friend in the group. I got a friend yesterday telling me, like, you have a completely different laugh when you're in front of your friend's circle. So, like, for me, if I can't make somebody laugh, I feel like I kind of failed that day. Really? Oh, yeah. That's it's interesting. Through, through trauma and therapy and all that, I figured out so much about my personality. It's kind of crazy. Maybe I need to go to therapy to figure out my personality. I think sometimes you never know. That or just get a good friend and crack open a bottle of wine, you know what I mean, and just talk about it. Um, cause like for you, you said you had, where well, you lost the class presidency. I so, lost, yeah, in fifth grade uh, and I haven't lost since. <laughs> <laughs> so that pivotal moment, the, the villain or hero arc started from it's that fair. moment. Yes. But like, what about that failure? Like really impacted you? Cause even to this day, it's something you remember. It was a public failure. Um, they announced the winner. I remember us standing in front of each other and they announced the winner and I just was like, all these people like looking you at me son of a yeah. and it's like <laughs> I really tried I thought I had it and I was just devastated and I just I just remember like trying not to cry and then crying and the people were like oh you're crying because you lost and I was like huh because I'm sad you know I'm sad and I'm in fifth grade you know so and then we live by each other too so I saw this man on the bus you know like every day so you had to eat that <laughs> loss. No wonder why you're so passionate now. You're like, all right, Alex, I'm proving everything you, you know what I mean? Yes. But I, it is interesting when you think about how we kind of find these core moments in our life. Yeah, and you see so. how they impact you. Have you seen other memories or other moments where you're like, this loss or this W propelled me to kind of where I am? 
Yes, when I competed pageants, I lost for 10 years straight until I became Miss Illinois four times in a row. And Wait a minute, four times in a row? Yeah, of course, I should have added that to the, the four-time Miss Illinois. Yes, I went to compete nationally, representing Illinois on four different pageant stages. And losing that really made me want to do it again. And you can't necessarily compete in a pageant until next year. So I'm stuck like with this loss. And then it was also like, also another public embarrassment because I paid for these pageants. My parents are here. My mom wasn't really supportive of me competing. She's like, well, maybe you should just quit. Like, no, I'm not going to quit till I win. <laughs> like, I have that Chloe mentality. I'm not going to quit till I win. Oh, yeah. So now I have to do it again because I can't leave this piece of um, who I, who, what I'm trying to do in my youth behind. Because when I look back at when I turn 80, I'm like, man, I wish I would have just kept going in this pageant industry thing. So I always wanted to just keep going just to win. So how'd you get into pageantry? It was natural because I was already on stage. And so I think I got something in the mail. I can't remember exactly how I got into the first pageant. But I started in eighth grade going to this modeling and acting school called Barbizon, which technically, I mean, it's still around, but sometimes those are like scams. Yeah. Um, so that was in eighth grade, and I was doing some fashion shows before eighth grade, and then we enrolled in there. And I think maybe I got a mailer about it, but I didn't actually compete until I was like almost a senior in high school when I could pay to compete from by myself. And what was it about that that caught your eye? Pretty girls on stage, and I felt like I could do that because I was already on stage naturally from doing theater, and so it felt like I could just I could do that. It felt it felt easy, and it just felt like not. A, it just felt like a transition of personality in a way. It felt like a natural progression to the spotlight. I think I just like the spotlight. I mean, anybody in media, I like the spotlight. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. I'm an entertainer. I like I like to have the mic in my hand and be the one that cracks the best joke that night. Yes, uh, I think we all have that word. Like, if you're in media, you do want to be the center of attention. Yeah. If you say you don't, you're lying to yourself. And I think it's okay to say that out loud because there's other people who can be backstage because that's their personality mm. behind the scenes, and that's okay. And I think that we need to kind of accept that. You know, what? I like the spotlight. I've always liked the spotlight. Um. Even when I did fashion shows, I would stay on the runway longer, and they'd be like, okay, wrap this this pose up, time <laughs> to go. You take that extra two-second <laughs> walk, like, oh, let me yes. get to the spot. <laughs> yes. And I think that pageants naturally allow me to do those things. So it brings out, like, your, your elegancy in a way. Yes. Okay. It's, to me, beauty pageants are, like, the essence of all that it takes to be, like, a woman. So I have to learn how to walk in heels. Like, I got to learn how to do my makeup, how to do my hair, how to present myself in such a way that is elegant and poised. I can't go up there and, you know, limping and doing like a pimp walk. You know, <laughs> I need a nice dress. I need to pretty much look good, but I also it's the interview part that no one sees. So I have to know how to talk to present myself to the judges in such a way. And I think that helps me nowadays. They're like the foundation. I think for hmm. a lot of people, you know, they might have sports or they go into the military to build like a foundation of who their personality will be. For me, I feel like pageants help build that foundation of who I am. Cause a lot of people now say that I'm very like proper, or people compare me to like Hillary Banks and say like I dress like very like. Oh my god! Wow, that connects so well that you said that right there. Like <laughs> people have called me kind of like Gabriel Iglesias. Yes. And He's like hilarious. once I've seen that comparison, I'm like, oh shit, that's actually true. Oh wow. He's funny. He, no, yeah, he'll He's, be here too. I know, I'm trying to interview him. You should go say hi. No, I'm trying. I already sent yeah. a message. I'm trying to hit the happen. So has there been a moment in your life where, so it seems like a lot of the self-identity with respect has kind of gravitated towards pageantry. Okay, I, am I, I off with that? No, you're not. No, you're not. Have you ever had a moment where you couldn't have that? Couldn't. What, or couldn't, couldn't do pageantry? You couldn't be involved in it? Like, I remember there was an instance with, with lockdown, right, with COVID and everything. I was doing radio since 2008 till 2020. Like, the radio was just me. Gotcha. And I lost it. And I went through this entire identity crisis of not having the one thing that like I was kind of connected to the most of my life. Mm -hmm. And did you ever have that moment? Not necessarily with pageants because they are, like, once a year. So it's, like, the pageant prep phase is probably, like, six months out from competition. I did feel like that when I was um, kindly dismissed from my television job in Rockford. I feel like I had an identity crisis because I made myself a brand as a TV reporter on air in Rockford. So when I was dismissed, then 
it was like, okay, well, what do I do? Like, what Ooh. do I do? And so I cut my hair off and I moved to Hawaii. But wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> that's like a turn I did not expect right there. See, I made you laugh now. No, <laughs> yeah, I work. appreciate it. So I got I got a lot to unpack there. Tell me if we'll just mow over the, nothing that you don't want to talk about. But what happened with being kindly dismissed? Kindly dismissed. So it's, that's like a future it's endeavor. A very. It's kind of, to me, it was more of an embarrassing reason. That's why it was kind of hard because, so, you know, Megan, the stallion. Mm-hmm. I cannot, Megan, we're close. I said <laughs> he was about to say, all right, <laughs> y'all know each other? <laughs> <laughs> so I was put onto Megan's music before she became who she is now. So this is 2019, 2018-ish. All right? Early Megan. Yeah, early Megan, when she still had mixtapes. Signed to nobody. I don't even know how I found out about her. So I'm doing my makeup one day at my desk at work. And it's a video uh, time lapse, so really fast motion showing the progression of putting on makeup. On my Instagram story, I chose a Megan song for the story, the Instagram story. My boss at the time, general manager, saw it on her fake Instagram account, her Finsta. Megan was cursing in the song, the whole song she was cursing. I probably used like 15, min- 15 seconds. And they said because she's cursing in the song and I was at work, it looks bad. But I was literally mm. kindly dismissed almost a year to the date that I started. Really? So that's interesting. Kind of wanted me, and I was going through some problems with the producers, probably from like Labor Day. This is like December, and probably for like three, four months, me and the producers were like at ends of like they were so new. I would I've been in TV for a long time. At Eastern, it's like a boot camp for news. We, I have two Emmy Awards because of my work at Eastern in TV news there. And my news director at the time, Kelly, she was on us. Like when you, when you got an email from Kelly, your heart dropped because she was probably going to yell at you over something that you did wrong for the show. So you got PTSD from this. It's pretty much yes, what pretty much. But I also was very good at news. And so we had two reporters who were green and they went to U of I. And no offense to U of I's news program, but they don't go live on TV. Easter, we went live on TV every day. It's a completely different animal when you live. Yes. And so in, and in college, because a lot of college stations don't have an actual functioning TV studio. So I would teach them news things that I knew, and they were, like, not receptive to it. And I had already been in business for, like, three, four years, and they had just graduated in May, and this is, like, September. So I'm like, your writing isn't the best. This is how we can clean it up. So we kept going back and forth. I was on air. I was anchoring. They would switch. I would change my script. They would switch it back. Original. Then I'd mess up on air. And so they would just kind of like throw me off on air. And we just kind of like were going back and forth. And then I think by, I think the universe or me subconsciously chose that song and that moment as an escape, an a easy way to get out of I that. Take a stand. Mm-hmm. Huh. And like looking back, you know, I regret it. Like, oh, I wish I would have stayed. But I don't think I would have still been there three, four, five months later, I think they would have found another reason to let me go. And I think that the universe or my inner person chose that song because maybe someone might see it and I'll get in trouble and I'll get, I'll be put out of this misery that I was in. I was, I was in misery. Yeah. You weren't happy. Yeah. And so I, I got dismissed 18 days for my birthday and so I didn't have to work on Christmas. <laughs> and so it was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, it it is a cruel world when you think about, it, especially in media, because yeah. that happens all the time. I got uh, kindly just future endeavored from my old station in Chicago mm. because uh, you know they phased out my position, and then Aww. they had offered me a. I was on air. They offered me to be back in the promotions department, but as only league. And I'm like, yo, oh, no. No. I worked my way out from that. Yes. Like, with no disrespect, but that that was four years ago, Ross. That's not, I'm a personality now. Like, I, yes, yes. You can't, take fillet, you can't take fillet off my plate. Like, all right. <laughs> Here's a I pork sausage. Like, no, nah, man. Like, that's funny. I got used to doing what I was doing. Yeah. So there's always a blessing in the, in the redirect when you think about it. Because no matter what happens, hey, what's going on? You're good. Don't worry about it. (laughs) (laughs) But when you think about it, there's blessings and redirects. No matter what the redirection is, there's something different that's going to happen that's going to challenge you and help you to grow. So off of there, where did you end up going? Hawaii. Cut your hair off, go to Hawaii. Hawaii. It uh, it wasn't the next day. Um, That also was 
crazy because that was December 2019. So what happened next naturally was COVID. And so I was fortunate to not have to cover COVID as a journalist. Imagine how that would have been. All of my friends who were working in TV at the time caught COVID because they were reporting on it. And this is, you know, we didn't know what it was in January. And so they were out in the field catching COVID, talking about like something's happening, yeah. you know, and then Kobe died. So I think that God allowed me not to be in news at that moment because I probably would not have liked news anymore. A lot of my friends probably left. I think a lot of them kind of left the business. It was really hard for a lot of them to kind of manage early 2020. And so uh, around the summertime, my cousin lived in Hawaii at the time. And because the plane tickets were so cheap at the time, I yeah. got a one flight, one way. It was $200 um, nonstop from Chicago, eight hours. I said, let me just go. And so I used my last little pennies I had. I was getting the unemployment. I was also yeah. getting the unemployment <laughs> checks. And I was like, oh, this is perfect because I got the initial extra six hundred dollars and i had that i was getting unemployment for almost i probably shouldn't say for almost yeah. like two years but yeah, yeah i mean i was on it for a while and i was just yeah. trying to make ends meet and i was struggling too yeah and so that's how i was able to go to hawaii so um, you just yeah. completely changed life you're like you know what screw this i'm yeah. i haven't been happy for a little bit I, I i need something different the world shuts down and you're like i'm gone yeah and because my a lot of my friends in rockford everyone knew me working in TV. So I didn't want to stay in Rockford because I couldn't go to the grocery store. I was dropped kick off TV. So no one knew what happened to me, but they would see me in the streets and ask like, why aren't you on TV anymore? And I didn't want to keep dealing with that. I was starting to break out really, really bad. I don't know why, but I just didn't like, I just didn't want to be in Rockford anymore. I would see Maybe the other anxiety? Station. Probably, probably, but it was really ugly. I didn't want to see the other, I, I would see a news car drive by. I, there's three stations. I applied to other two stations. They didn't want me. I said, I just need to go because I'm not going to stay here and just walk around and look embarrassed with this egg on my face and have to explain, yeah, I got fired because I played a Megan Thee Stallion song on Instagram. Like, it's, it was hard to explain. But I did file a lawsuit. We went to our deposition. We, it went far in the process. But we kind of mutually agreed to just, like, let it go because I got that unemployment check. And I ended up making more on my unemployment than I did at the station. Did you get the, I'm sorry, and then you're like, all right, fine. That's what I wanted. I'm out. Um, no, in a deposition, a lot of information was unveiled. Uh -huh. You know, when you go to court cases, you learn a lot. And so I learned about how the dismissal came about and, like, why I was denied from promotions. Because I sued them for wrongful termination, discrimination. And um, retaliation. Oh, <laughs> I should make a mixtape called that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, because um, I was anchoring, interim anchoring, because another anchor wasn't there, and then they hired another girl to anchor. There was three openings for the morning anchor position. They hired one girl to do all three when I was already doing all three. When she could technically just hired her and kept me there. Hmm. No second way. Um, so, once I got that information... And then it was just like, I'm in the beach on Hawaii. Like, I don't, you know, like, what, 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 what am I fighting mindset. here? Yeah. yeah. What, am I, what am I really fighting here? And I'm getting unemployment checks. I was getting more in my checks than I was at the station. So I think that's something people don't understand when it comes to media. Yeah. Um, there's a select few that get paid a good amount of junk. At the top. And there's, there's the whole other group that we're just, you know what? We make ends meet where we can. Yeah. And yeah. it's interesting because I remember when I got like, oh, I've, I ended up working at Ace Hardware. They're like, weren't you on the radio? I'm like, yep, I was. Aww. Anyways, here's this two pack for five. <laughs> Keep it moving. <laughs> Stop asking questions. Yes, I get that. Yes, so, we don't make a lot. So no, and it's not a complaint because I, I absolutely love what I do. Same. And you know, I'm just the ability to be a personality, to be entertaining, to be engaging, helping the community. That's awesome. Yeah, I agree. But there is a reality <laughs> to it where it's like... The checks are cute. It's just cute. <laughs> yeah. That's how it is. But like the, the era of... I know I can speak for radio because I've never been on TV. But in radio, like back in the day, they used to say we were superstars. We were celebrities. Yeah, Not no more. Uh, yeah, we were. You guys, I, I would say you guys are. I know the radio personalities in Chicago very well. I know they're always out and about. I think it's hard, too, because there's no like visual aspect to it. So people kind of listen to the radio in their car and they know your name, but they don't necessarily see your face. Oh, yeah. So I think that that's kind of where it kind of fell off. But I think that a lot of people need to just, 
I think radio is hard, yeah, because there's no visual element to it. I think you guys are still superstars. I think we're trying. I think uh, what this podcast is, is trying to ingrain me more into the community as much as possible. And definitely, whenever I take Rock, I, he's more known in this community than I am now. Yeah. I'll be honest. Like, people recognize Rock when I'm out for a walk. They're like, is that Rocky? I'm Aww. like, yeah. Hi. Do we know each other? <laughs> like, That's yeah. kind of cool. <laughs> Does he have an Instagram account? No, he should. I kind of just force it all through mine so I get all the endorsements. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, you know, I'm a social media superstar, so I can help you make it. Yeah. My dogs have an Instagram account. Yeah, you have two dogs, right? I Yeah, one is mine, one is his cousin. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, look, the so- social media superstar thing, What? tell me more about this. So, a lot of my work is behind the cameras, so... Under my LLC, Big Square Productions, I help other small businesses learn how to navigate Instagram and Facebook and help them bring up their social media presence because a lot of times people, small business owners, they just like the actual business. Like if you sell honey, you just like honey and beekeeping. But a lot of you, you're missing out a lot of clients Mm -hmm. and money by not being on social media. So I help a lot of people um, get their Instagram set up and help them learn how to make reels a lot of them are like bloomers, Gen Xers. Mm-hmm. Um, but it kind of started off as a hobby and it just kind of blew up into something. And on my personal Instagram account, too, I love making reels. It's one of my favorite things to do. That's your thing. I love it. I love it. I love making, I love taking pictures. I love editing. I just edited a video for somebody yesterday. It took me probably like 30 minutes and I probably shot 15. I, I can show it to you. It's a, it's a promo for his clothing company. And I just love it. I love editing a lot. So you're a nerd about editing. Yeah, yeah. Audio, video, yeah. all of it. Audio, audio to me, I used to work in NPR or well, public radio. I don't like audio editing per se because it's just blank. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I do like being creative. Yeah. And that's one thing I like about the news is that I could tell and writing, storytelling. So my thing is writing and shooting and then editing it all together. So what what sets you on fire when it comes to the writing process? Well, I think writing is how I started being creative originally. I wrote two books when I was in fourth grade, two children's books. You and wrote two books in fourth grade? Yes. One, and it was crazy. I don't want to age myself. One of the books was about Do it. September 11th from the kid's perspective. And it, like on the cover, and it's so cryptic to like look at it. It's like the cover of it is... A dad and a daughter watching the Twin Towers, but it's from their perspective. You don't see you don't see the Twin Towers, but the quote says, "Daddy, are we gonna die?" And like I drew it and everything, and it's like you is this grim what I... ass little kid, yo. <laughs> like wait a minute, B, hold on. Because I witnessed it, and then I wrote a book about it, and it was kind of like as if if someone took a case study of the kids who watch, because I watched that happen live yeah. on TV. You know, I don't think people realize that's PTSD for a whole generation of kids who were not at school yet. I feel like we're probably around the same age group. So when it happened, I was in maybe fourth grade. I forgot. Fourth, fifth, sixth, somewhere around there. And they they brought in the TV, like the the stand, oh and they put it on in the classroom. We it I I, I very vividly remember. I, I can see it right on my mind. I close my eyes. I see the smoke off the first tower, and mm. we witness a second plane hit that second tower. Yes, and I saw it, and I, I didn't know what to do. I was like, we just started. Uh, this one girl, what her name was? Uh, I think Rachel. She started. No, Alyssa. She started drawing a card and get us all to sign it. We didn't know what the hell we were doing, mm. but that was her. Like she needed to do something. Yeah. Like where were you when you sit in? I was at home. I was at home on my way to school when I saw it. And I saw it live. I don't know how the TV came on or what. I just remember watching it live before I went to school. And what were you thinking when you saw it? I don't remember. I thought it was fake. But maybe because I used to play with Legos at the time. Maybe it was like a simulation of Legos coming down. I don't think it really grasped until like later. I do remember seeing the first plane back in the sky. That's something I really remember. I don't think the depth of what happened hit me. But I do remember saying like, oh, look, now they're flying planes again. Like afterwards, because remember everything was grounded for a while. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so I don't think that I had like any sad emotion at the time. Cause I probably didn't understand the depth of what was happening. 
Yeah. Yeah, I I mean, same. I just remember seeing that plane hit. And I was like, what the hell's happening? Yeah, and I feel like school that day was regular. I don't think anything, I don't remember school that day, but I don't think anything significant changed in my life. I'm like, oh, I feel like we're in danger. But when I was, you know, when I wrote that first book, definitely felt like they were going to die or something. Yeah, that's that's intense. So you wrote that from that. And there was a second book you wrote. The second book was based around, let me see, it was based around a girl. It wasn't nothing related to that. I think I can't really remember. Uh, I can't really remember at all, but it was based around a girl in school, and I think she was on a mission to do theater. Now I think, yes, her name was Robin, <laughs> and she was trying to audition for the school play. And that's all I really remember about it. So you pretty much told your future story, is what you said. Yeah, I think so. So then we'll so. we'll flash forward years later. You said you uh, you have a couple book you have a book coming out or I that's pre ordered right now. Pre order, yes. And what's this book? By the time this airs, it should be out. This, this will week. air tomorrow, Wednesday. Oh, no, it won't be out. It's still available for pre-order. Okay. Um, it's called The Book of Beauty. It's dedicated to anyone who's going through an interview process, but specifically for pageant girls, because one of the parts of competing at a pageant is interview, and a lot of girls fail in that part. And because I'm so equipped to know about <laughs> how to conduct an interview, I said, let me just go ahead and do this. I did a lot of coaching with pageant coaches before who helped me out with interview. Um, I've been a pageant judge numerous times to see how people act in the interview room. And I have a formula and a system that I do myself and that I coach other pageant contestants to do for the interview. And so let me just put this all in the book because I hate to see people fumble. And pageants are won or lost in the interview room. And that's usually conducted, no one sees that when they come to a competition, but usually conducted private um, with, ju- with the judges in different formats. Sometimes it's one-on-one like round robin speed dating style, sometimes it's panel interview, like a press conference. But um, sometimes they're like two minutes, sometimes they're 10 minutes long. So it's a book dedicated to pageant girls to get a formula down and for them to dive deeper in who they are so they know how to push an agenda when it comes to the interview and how to kind of stay on top of your game and give out the best answers and not say anything you don't want to say in the pageant interview room. So, so what are some examples, if you mind, like some interview questions that you've been asked? I, You know, typically it's just like getting to know your questions because there's probably like a host of girls who are there. I did one interview because there were so many girls at 6 a.m. Yo, so, nobody yeah. wants to talk about themselves at 6 in the morning. <laughs> like, <laughs> no judge want to sit through 50 people yeah. from 6 to 8 a.m. in the morning. That's a um, lot. That's early. Yes. Because then you got to get you got to get all beautified. You mm-hmm. got to get ready. And yes, I got to pump myself have, up. Yeah, you have to get you have to wake. You have yeah. to you know, get awake. You I have, have to be more energized than them. Because yeah. you have to sell the personality. Mm-hmm. So all of it is just putting on this aesthetic, but also staying true who you are on the inside. Yeah, I mean you can see through that in the interview. If someone's giving you something that's not authentic, you can see that you're such a crack. And for me, when I'm a judge, sometimes I'm like that mean judge. So I won't even say anything. I'll just look at you and be like, hmm. Oh, yeah, that's Simon Cow. <laughs> You're like, hmm. And write things down. Know. I'll play like mind games and be like, hmm. <laughs> so that way they think that um, I'm being mean and then I am. But that's, like, that's kind of how you break down a person. Because you want to see if the girl, ultimately you want to crown someone who isn't just, um, she's out in a community, but she's going to be nice. Because she's going to wear this crown and sash and go out and meet people. So I want to make sure that she's approachable. So if someone feels like I'm being mean and they're mean back, oh, I'm not going to crown you because mm-hmm. now you're not approachable to me. I just cracked your shell. You're really mean on the inside. That's your, you know. Have you like seen that. that happen a lot? Not necessarily. Um, from the, some of the stuff that I judge, no, not really. But I've seen pageant girls who get crowned and then become me. Or the, a lot of people become fake after crowning. Like they were so nice the whole weekend or the whole week. Crowning happens, and then they just go AWOL, and then you never hear from them again. And it's like, wow, Becky, you were just kicking it all week. And I guess she was just being a fake friend. So that's the, Yeah. So, like, that's interesting you say that because, like, you know, you'll have somebody go through this entire rigmous remote of everything going on, and then they just, all right, I won, that's it, game out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or if they lose. Sometimes it's the losers, the sore losers, who are just so upset that they just, their true self come out. And it's like, that's why you didn't win, because you're not pure on the inside. And just to start do that. 
So that's interesting because, like, you you said you lost four years, what was four years, years in a row? Ten years in a row. Ten years in a row. Ten years in a row, but that still didn't alter you. You're like, nah, no. If anything, I'm going to get more dedicated. Yes, I am Kobe. Kobe <laughs> and Kanye was who I listened to the most preparing for pageants. Really? Mm-hmm. So what was the what were the songs immediate for uh, Kanye? Kanye, it was pretty la, much, yeah, la, pretty much the whole la, graduation, la. like registration. But it was more so his mentality of feeling like he's the best. I don't know if you watched the documentary, but mm-hmm. he knew where he would be today back then. Oh, he would talk about it all the time. Yeah. He was like, I'm dope. You're going to find out. Yes, exactly. So that's kind of, and that's kind of how Kobe was too. And Kobe would, for me, Kobe was like the work ethic. And it's like, am I really going hard for my dream if I'm not doing it like Kobe? Like, do I really want this? If I'm not waking up at 4 a.m., do I really want this? And I had to question that quite a few times. Hmm. And so that's why I would listen to Kobe because it's like, he was like the, uh, like, top of are you really going after your dreams as hard as you can the epitome of everything mm-hmm. like he was the the figurehead yep. that reinstilled that passion dedication into you mm-hmm. yes did you ever have moments because i know with my anxiety i have moments where like i fear that I, i'm being inauthentic at moments or i'm too authentic like i, I kind of it, it, it was a process now in my 30s i'm like i don't give a damn you're gonna like me you're not gonna <laughs> like me like i'm being true to who i am do you have a, you ever have moments where you're like all right, I'm too stubborn about X, Y, Z. How did I come across? Or were you just always like, this is the mission. I, I'm going to get this done. Those that rock with me, rock with me. If not, sorry. I think I think naturally, just being in your 20s, I think naturally you have like that anxiety. I think as you just get older, that, that kind of goes away. Because for me, it was like more so because I was losing so much, it made me wonder, like, should I keep doing this? Like, if they're not going to crown me, should I even bother trying to play their game? Um, and it was also more so, like, pride. Like, oh, I'm not going to quit because now I have to win. And I know I can't, <laughs> you know. So, no, I don't really have anxiety. At this point, I do feel like now I don't really care what people say. But I think that's naturally because I've been diving deep into my faith and – I try not to be mean, and if I know that I'm being, if I'm saying exactly how I feel, and if I'm saying something that is not um, debatable, then you can't question it. Like, even at work now, I'll tell people what's going on or the struggles that a lot of the reporters are facing. If I'm like the reporter liaison to the managers, I say, no, we can't do this because of this, this, and this. And they, I'm not wrong. And so if I'm not wrong, then you can't question what I'm doing. Back in the day, I would have an attitude and I would yell, but now I think I've used my words way better than I used to. And More effective. To me, yeah. yeah. More effective communication. Better communication. Yeah. I mean, through trial and error, nobody's perfect when they first start in the industry. I mean, I had my ups and downs of misspeaking and being yeah. too passionate as they would like to deem it. Yeah. But as you live, you learn through your errors and you mature and you start understanding, wait, no. This is my personality. This is who I am. I'm effective with what I'm doing, and I'm exactly. starting to find my ways and process of being more effective and utilize them as best as I can. Yes. And then I think naturally it's like when I think about things, like what is my goal out of this conversation? Like I try not to yell at people because I can really say some mean things. So I'm like, okay, do they warrant my tongue lashing right <laughs> now or not? Because if I say something, it's going to hurt their feelings and it might alter our relationship moving forward because I said some really mean things. Like, I watch Housewives on the South Side. <laughs> my, my, what is it? Um, My roasting game is oh, yeah. so strong. <laughs> and I was like, do I want to activate this superpower of mine <laughs> or not? And so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to spare you. And that's kind of how I think about it. I'm sparing you what you could hear. <laughs> and like, what's the goal? So if like if the goal at work is for me to not do a task because I just can't, then I'm not going to yell at you because I'm gonna you're gonna miss it. You're gonna miss the message. So I know I have to bring myself back down so that way you understand why this isn't gonna be accomplished. So now that's kinda how I look at it. If I really wanna be heard, I think about what the goal is. Now, if you deserve to be yelled at, you will. But I don't really do that anymore because blood pressure <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what that's yeah. the good you gotta keep the blood pressure down you gotta keep it because you gotta think like that literally kills you i don't want to go into a whole tangent but like no yeah. just being a black woman i have diabetes high cholesterol in my family i 
currently have high blood pressure is not like diagnosed, but every time I check it, it's high. And so like, do I really want to die over this encounter mm. with this person? And the answer is no. The answer no, is no. I have my it. vices that I do at home. That's when I recharge. And it's like, is this worth dying over from a high blood pressure no. when I turn 50? And the answer is no, it's not. Most of these fools that try to get a reaction out, you're just trying to get that. And at the end of the day, it's just not worth it. I it's, found it's that. It's not worth it. That's why I'm I'm recluse when I'm home because I'm like this fool. I got my dog with me, Rocky. Yeah. Rocky brings me so much joy, and I'm yeah. like, you know what? Let me just chill, have my vices, hang out, recharge yeah. my pill, mm-hmm. and just keep going from there. And everything is temporary too. And I come to learn that from having so many jobs that like I would probably go off on somebody, and I don't even know who they are today, you know, and nobody's. Yeah. So it's like it's temporary. Everything is temporary. I probably won't even know them in five years. So is it worth it? today and the answer is no it's worth spiking that blood pressure yeah that's interesting i mean you do have a lot of gigs as we're also going down all the things you do we have the patches of prosecco your your podcast that you do how how's that going it's good i just dropped an episode today about the book about manifesting confidence in the interview room it's really good i'm really i'm doing like a reinvigoration i guess you could say of it so it's like a patches of prosecco 2.0 so now I'm focusing more on mindsets. Before I would interview at pretty much anyone in the industry about like coaching tips or getting in their brain to help my listeners kind of get better at competing. So now I'm diving more into the mindset aspect of competing because that's really all it is, is mindset. The looks of it, the gown, the swimsuit body is nothing if your mind isn't there. So I'm relaunching it. I'm moving to the Heights and I have a studio in my house. Nice. And so now I'm excited to do this 2.0 version of it. And I'm going to have merch, I have a book. And so that's kind of just, and I'm, we're putting it on YouTube too. So I have a whole little umbrella of pageants and beauty things coming She's out of it. doing everything. Yes, there's a lot of money out here. And I, <laughs> my rent is real. My new place rent, this was, this was cute. He had civic center, it was a cute rent. Yeah. The heist is not playing games. Yeah, I, I've been told there's a different, <laughs> uh, different caliber over there. It is, it is. So your, 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 your one year just came up. Our one year anniversary. So, oh, for in Peoria or for the podcast? Uh, in Peoria. Yeah, one year. So, what's in store for year two? I really want to do deeper stories. I just did a story today that was really good, and a story yesterday that I really enjoyed too. Both of them were like two, three minutes long. Yesterday's story was about a guy cleaning tombstones for Memorial Day. Today's story was about a girl who needed a heart transplant, and she got it. And she was actually going to surgery today, so she was able to talk to me real fast. So I want to be able to tell more long-form journalism and dive deeper into, like, historical pieces. That's kind of where I nerd out is history. Ooh, what 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 catches your uh, attention or intrigue that much about that stuff? Um, unknown black history is really interesting. Haunted history is so interesting. Oh, get out of here. No, you like ghosts and all that? I'm I lo- Mexican. I love- I'm superstitious. Yeah. Don't even bring that up on my I head. love haunted history. Love it. Like... No. Or just history. Like, okay, so you know how Chicago had the gangs going on? I found out where John Dillinger, one of the biggest bank robbers in the 1920s, where he actually got shot and killed by the police. He was, he left. He escaped jail twice. No. And the second time, he escaped for a couple of months. He was on the run. He was in Indiana and Chicago. They found him in this theater. I can't remember what area of Chicago that's in. It's like Lakeview area. They found him in the theater it was a whole little shootout. He ran outside, died in the alleyway. I went to the alleyway, took a picture. Like, oh, my God, John Dillinger died right here. How cool is that? <laughs> That's the nerdiest thing you said. I'm a body language person. And I just seen you, like, get so excited, it's big so ass cool. smile. You're like, ah, <laughs> like, so nerded out. Yes. But what, what, like, what about it just intrigues you so much? I don't know. I think it's just history. Just being a history buff and knowing that history happened right where I'm standing is super cool to me. Um. I did a story on Juneteenth about Nancy Leggins Costly. I was able to walk the same streets that she walked. Like, whoa, like 200 years ago, this lady Nancy was right here. Like, oh my gosh. It's, it it kind of like putting yourself back into that time period. Hmm. I love watching like the historical movie, not not old movies, but movies based on t- things in the past, especially when they do it this year and it's historically accurate. I'll watch it, Google everything that happened. Like, oh, my gosh, he actually did wear this red shirt on this day. And they had the movie was 100% correct. Like, that to me just, like, is so cool. It just cool. changes everything. Like, it just, so you're able to mentally kind of just 
time loop back there. Like, yeah. hey, and you just put yourself in that little time frame? Yeah, I guess I do. Yeah, I do. Huh. And I think that just being from Chicago, so much history, all different types of history. I went to Aunt Jemima. She was the syrup lady. Mm. I didn't know she was from Chicago. I found her tombstone. I was like, oh, my God, this is the Aunt Jemima's tombstone. I was like, holy cow, like, she's right here buried. Like, that's so cool. Do you do, like, uh, haunted houses? Not, like, the the, no. the the fake ones, but, like, if it's a haunted place, you want to ever go there and be yes. like, for real? Yeah. No, yeah. get out of well, here. Like, Hawaii is one of the most haunted places Look. I've ever been to, ever. And I couldn't help. To me, I don't want to see it, but it's, like, I'm kind of curious. Do you want to see if, like, a ghost pops up somewhere? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I mean, but I don't want to. You would like, try to interview the ghost, wouldn't you? I, no, if I see it, I probably would cry. I'd run my ass I so would, quick. I, yeah, no, I couldn't actually see it, but just knowing that something happened here where I'm standing, so cool. I don't really? know why. Yeah, so cool. See, I don't know. I, maybe it's a Mexican <laughs> me, but I, I would panic and I start praying the rosary so good. Whoever saw a ghost, like I don't want to enable that. Even right now, I'm getting a little. I know. Well, I, mean, I am getting it. a little goosebumpy. <laughs> Hell no. No, no, no. I'm going to be up all night tonight. No, like, oh my God. you know what? I'm going to light all my uh, Virgin Mary candles. No, that's crazy. So what are, what are the geeky things you like really geek out on? I would say history, um, technology. I'm like a technology buff. I have so many like little knickknacks. I probably have four tripods in my house. <laughs> I have one in the car, but I gave it away to somebody. My podcast equipment. Um like wires. I used to work behind the scenes in TV. I went to a mega church, and so I started off in TV at the mega church, and so I was like pulling wires and all the other fun stuff. What what, what mega church? Salem Baptist Church, Chicago. Reverend, uh, Reverend Meeks. Yeah, my mom used to watch us religiously. Yes, yes. I'd come down from stairs when I used to live there back in the day, and she had Reverend Meeks out all the yes. time. That and is so a I was probably small helping world. to put him on TV. That is a small world, yo. Pretty she cool. loved them. Oh my god! Yes, that's crazy. So you just had you just had a, a complete life experience already in, in the years that you lived. I You've done so it. much. Yeah, I had like a new job every year, pretty much. So why yeah. is that? Just a new <laughs> challenge, or just something new? Yeah, I think so. Even I moved every year since I left the house when I went away to college for the first time. I moved every single year, and so, now here I am again, moving again. Yeah. A year later. I don't know. It's the way the universe has it set up. I don't know. Do you see like part of it is kind of just like fear being stagnant? No, I don't think it's a fear. Things happen in my life where. Oh, you're just ready for change. No, things just happen where I had to. Oh, change. okay. Yeah. I'm like. Like I was either kindly dismissed. So I needed to find something else. And I chose to leave. Like the universe allowed an opening and I took it. I was a college professor. And then I didn't want to be. I was in Decatur. <laughs> You're a college professor. <laughs> B, like, what is going on? <laughs> I think I could have made a paragraph of this intro for you if I really wanted to. It was in Decatur. I was a, I was a TV producer. I was a college professor. I didn't want to be in Decatur anymore. I was kind of dismissed my TV job in Decatur. And then I was teaching. And then I didn't want to stay in Decatur anymore. And so I left to go find the next best thing. <laughs> I forgot what I did after that. I went to Texas. To Texas, and <laughs> you just you know open the business in Texas. <laughs> I see that's the thing about pageantry. So because I compete against fifty girls, I have friends in all these states. Um, so Miss Alabama at the time lived in Texas and invited me to her house. She had an actual house, and so that's how I got in to go to Texas. So I was like, okay, cool. Now I'm gonna I'll just go to Texas. Just in the wind. That's the Sagittarius, and you just being in the wind. The tickets were forty dollars on Southwest from Chicago <laughs> to Dallas. Bought it, went out there, liked it, drove out there, liked it. Me and her fell off because she wanted to move her boyfriend in, blah, blah, blah. And then I moved on to my own. So things just happened where a year later, I just, like, even at this place, I was told my lease wasn't going to go month to month. A year later, so now I have to move. So here you are. Yeah. Just a new venture. Mm -hmm. So what are the new ventures you got coming up? So the podcast is my big one. My pageant, Miss Illinois Earth, is my big one. Uh, I really wanted to make it a thing out here in Peoria. I kind of know the power of the pageantry out here. You so. do have something coming up with that, right? Yes. Uh, what's going on? This is the, you're the Illinois State Director, Miss Illinois Earth Beauty Pageant. Uh, you said that you have some events coming up this yes. week. Miss Juneteenth is happening. So right now for the Juneteenth celebration, Juneteenth is June 19th. That Monday's a federal holiday. But... 
um, the Yanni Collective is throwing the Juneteenth celebration, which is very customary across all black cultures all across the country is having a Juneteenth. But also what they have at Juneteenth is Miss Juneteenth, which is a pageant competition. And the girl represents Juneteenth at the celebrations and throughout the year. And so I'm bringing Miss Juneteenth to Peoria for the very first time that I believe is the very first time. And we are appointing a girl for this year. And then next year, we're going to have a whole competition for a Miss Juneteenth. Oh, so awesome. underneath my umbrella of Miss Illinois Earth, I'm able to give out local titles. And one of the local titles I'm giving out is a Miss Juneteenth. That's amazing. Yeah. Ah. It'll be really cool. So right now we're appointing and we're going to announce the winner um, the week before Juneteenth. So that she can go on press tours and promote it and tell people kind of what the celebration is about. So how does it feel like you're going on year two and now you're starting to do these big things for the community. Now you're starting to find these deeper, long with stories that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. You're bringing in uh, Miss Juneteenth, which is something that's new. You have these ventures. Now you have the podcast. We're going to start doing a lot more. You have the book. You have all this, and Peoria seems to be a, a place of growth. It is. It is. I see so much potential here. So much money is here. Yeah. <laughs> and I do kind of, I do kind of get tired of moving so much that I do want to make roots. And I feel like Peoria is perfect. Just being from Chicago, I can just hop on the highway, go back home. And being in news, I feel like one thing that I was fortunate to see was people, <laughs> the same people on TV for years who are still on TV. And I think that's, that's something that people here are kind of missing out on is having consistent news personalities um, because it's, you know, it's a starter market. And so I do want to sit down somewhere finally. And I feel like Peoria is the perfect place to do it because there's so much happening. And like I said, I lived in Decatur, Springfield, Charleston, Rockford, in Chicago. And I think Peoria is the most progressive city outside of Chicago in Illinois, period. Really? I think Rockford is too, but I think Rockford will be second to me. Peoria, there's just so much that everyone is doing that, like, everybody. Like, I'm always somewhere. I was just at the country club the other day. You know, it's just, it's just having access and the capabilities to be in these rooms and in these spaces because of my job and what I do, I see so much potential in this community. Yeah. And so I want to make it, I want to do things here because there's just so much that, and I don't think people that live here see that, see the opportunity here. And I think by working in news, I have like a, a little bit of a privilege, I guess I could say, because I talk to the mayor all the time. I'm talking to city council all the time. People who live in probably some of the, more disadvantaged economic areas probably don't have that kind of access to mm. some of these spaces that I am able to go into. And so I see all the growth that can happen and the potential in this area, and I just love it. I love there, it there is. I think uh, in the year I've been here, I've noticed that Peoria has this huge heart uh, helping cans. Yes. So through the podcast, I've been able to meet individuals like uh, Hetty Elliott or Becky Rossum or Marcel Somerville, mm -hmm. different people, Carl Holloway. People that are pouring back into the community as best as they can with their abilities. Right. So it, it's brought me a lot of fire. Like, okay, I feel like I can ask good questions. I feel like I can entertain. I feel like I could get the good nuggets out of somebody in an interview like what we do now. And I'm like, okay, maybe I can use my talents here to enrich the community by collecting stories. Yeah. So I'm a nerd about sitting down and just legit. I could talk to somebody for five hours if they let me. Yeah. And I could just talk and make the five hours seem effortless. I feel like that's the talent God's blessed me with in a way. Like and um, I've also been seeing that. Like this area can be very fruitful just by broadcasting people's stories. Yes. Yeah. And I did see something like somebody was leaving the station. And I remember I saw somebody put, uh, you know, God bless her. She's going to be amazing, whatever, whatever, wah, wah, wah. But then somebody put, yeah, this is a starter market. We never really had. The good ones leave. And I remember I saw that. I'm like, damn, I, low key, I don't want nobody to tell you that about me. Like, the good ones leave. I kind of want to, like, build the community up. And whatever happens, happens. It's just because the way the news works, and you know this too, market size is based off population size. And... Being from Chicago, out of college, the odds of me getting a job in TV news in Chicago, yeah. virtually impossible. Yeah. You have to start in the smaller communities, make your mistakes, and then go to bigger ones. So naturally, what people do from Chicago is come to like a Peoria or a Rockford or a Decatur or Champaign, go to Milwaukee next, and then Chicago. They have to make those jumps. Or like after 
a small town, you go to like Little Rock, if you want to say in the Midwest, and then make it to Chicago. You have to go to those small TV stations, like four t- stops at least, before you are good at your job. And because we have contracts, a lot of people don't stay longer than two years because the money isn't there. The reporters in Chicago, I know, make minimum eighty thousand dollars. Yeah, it's it's and so it's very different in a big city. <laughs> yeah, so then there's no real um, and like initiative to stay here if one you're being scouted at a bigger station, or some people go to network. You know, they go to CNN, MSNBCs, and if I'm getting paid pennies here, and I could do the same job, if not easier, because right now I'm doing everything. I'm my own camera person. Milwaukee. Oh, I've I, seen you out there. I've seen you do everything. I remember what, what I remember we were at? We're the, at MS? Walk, the MS Walk. And I just remember, I, I peeped you. You were camera. You take your own B-roll. Then you took your own interview questions. Then you took uh, stills. And yeah. I'm just like, yo, what is she doing? Yeah. And then a lot of times if you see me out at a story, like if you're watching the news and you see me at the scene, I shot that myself. I'm shooting myself, myself. Write it. I edit it. Post to the website. Post to social. In bigger markets, I wouldn't have to do that. I don't yeah. have. I would have a camera guy. By union laws, like in Milwaukee, you got a camera person. Yeah. CNN, I probably wouldn't ever touch a camera. I probably wouldn't ever edit. You know. And so it's like I'm doing the same work. So a reporter, I'm doing more work here, and I can make more and do a little bit less if I move up. So the options just juicy at that point. You're like. It is. It's extremely tempting, like it is. Because I know here in, in radio, I I wear, I would I did not do nearly anything compared to what I'm doing here back in Chicago when I was on air there. But what I have seen is my skill set has improved drastically in the year I've been here because I've been forced to. I think you understand that you and I are only as good as the last thing we produced or put out. Yeah, I agree. Because you could you could have. Ten great stories back to back to back, but you do one shitty story. You broadcast one bad thing. You're off by just a millimeter. Now you're seeing it differently. Right. But, yeah, you do have those mean comments. No one's going to say anything to my face, so I don't worry about it. It doesn't bother you at all? No. No one says anything bad. It used to bother me. I, I can't, I'll, be, I'll be very honest with you. It used to bother me so much where I'm like, but that's not what I meant. That's yeah. not what I wanted you to perceive of it. Mm. So, like, I think my issue is I found out in my therapy where I'm a people pleaser. It's like the 10th. Mm. So I had to knock that off where I'm like, they can only perceive from their view lens. Yeah. They can't see, like I was talking to Alfred Conti this past weekend about how he's an observer. He's an observer and he puts out whatever you take from it is your life perspective. Yeah. And yeah, that's exactly. great. That's beautiful. But he had to take himself out of... um being too fixed on this is the message I wanted for you to get. But the oh. fact that you just got a message is everything to him. I understand that, especially being a painter. It's like your interpretation. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I can understand that from his perspective. And that's too. And so for me, I feel like I've done so much growth internally that I've, I had to kind of realize that some people probably didn't do that work internally. And they're <laughs> haters. Like they can't help themselves because they don't have that. They didn't do that work yet and some people just live in a gutter and i'm just not gonna go there all right i got two last questions for you okay if anybody likes to get involved or to uh reach out about get involved with miss juneteenth or the podcast anything that you're doing how can they get a hold of you it's pretty easy um i would say the best methods i would just get my phone number out probably you're brave 309-634-1489. Miss Juneteenth, we are appointing until Monday, June 5th. Is that the 5th? Um, I'll find out right now. And Miss Illinois Earth yep. is July 16th. I'll probably take applications. That's for, that's for girls 18 and 26. I'll take applications probably up until July 9th. I think that's that Monday. Uh, the week before the pageant. Um, the podcast, my pageant podcast, is dedicated to pageant people specifically, unless you're able to help coach a pageant girl. So if you are a stylist or a makeup artist um, or a hairstylist or um, someone who's good at understanding mindset and that kind of coaching, then maybe I'll allow you on. But mainly I interview people in the pageant industry, people who 
big names in the industry. Um, and then also I had my B Square Productions company pr help produce the Fashion Week, Peoria Fashion Week. And so I do live event production. And so that's probably the best way people outside of news can get a hold of me is if you need a live event produced, I can more than likely help you out there when it comes to like stage management. If you have a story for the news, same phone number, 309-634-1489. Please text me. Don't call. I might not answer if it's like, who is this? But sometimes I do. I'm curious. I'm just curious. You are brave. Like, you're, you're not the first person. There's multiple people here in media that have given out their real cell phone number. And I don't know if it's because uh, Chicagoan or Chicago media personality that <laughs> has been great since 2008 of who I am. Yeah. I like nah, bro. Well, hit my Instagram. My black button is strong, <laughs> so I have no worries about that. I'll give you that. Um, but if you have if you have a, a story either about you or someone you know, that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. I'm always looking for story ideas. My email is bbrooks b b r o o k s at w e k dot com. Um, and Instagram, the Brett Brooks, like Megan, T H E E B R E T T B R O O K S. Nice. Double I, letters. I like it. The, the. You have to the let them know. Brett Brooks. Mine's the Husky Heartthrob. Just put that out there. Oh, you know? nice. <laughs> I'm going to follow you now. I'm going to follow you so I can tag you with a picture and everything. Um, okay. So, last question uh, now that we've been through everything. Yes. It doesn't have to be the last question. I have plenty of time. Oh, well, maybe not. We'll see. You know, I've been talking for like an hour now. Are we really? Yeah. I guess you still gotta edit all this. Stuff. Yeah. The, see, the, <laughs> but this is what I love about this is what I love about what I do. I'm able to sit down with somebody and have an hour long conversation and feel like 15 minutes have gone by. It does. Feel like 15 minutes. Because we're able just to toss ideas. The the art of dialogue, I feel, is a lost art form. I agree. I agree. Because a lot of interviewers, they try to, and you don't do this. I've seen some of your stories. You definitely don't do this, but. They try to be more informed about the person they're interviewing. Mm -hmm. And, like, it's not about you. It's about the individual. Oh, I see what you're saying. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Like, I brought you on. Let's talk about you. I can, yeah. I can pivot with certain things about myself to, like, you know, bring some association with this, I some parallel. Yes. But it's not about me. Yeah. If you want to follow my Instagram, see, it's all about rock. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? <laughs> But the question I love to ask anybody that stops in for the podcast okay. um, is is this. It's as simple as each of these stories I collect are stories. And every story has a nugget of wisdom, information, something to take away from. It's like reading a book. You gain something from that message, that perspective. So when your story is all done, what do you want people to take away from your story, your journey, things you've been through? I would say, one, that I am a creative person and I put my talent out into the world in all aspects. I have a higher goal I want to achieve. Do you want to know what it is? Please tell me. My goal is to get an EGOT. What that is? Uh, an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a uh, Tony. Yes. 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 So you want to do everything. Yes. I mean, I feel like one piece of art can ultimately get you all four. Technically, I technically already have an Emmy collegiate one, but I want one solo. Um, so for me is that I gave so much of my creative self out. But I also want to be able to want, I be like synonymous with beauty and helping girls get confidence and self-esteem. I think that's one thing that's missing in a lot of girls is confidence. And I wish someone would have came to me and been like, because, you know, I, I had glasses, you know what I'm saying? I had glasses and I had acne early. And so I look kind of bogus, you know what I mean? I look kind of bogus. <laughs> but I was still so passionate about being on stage despite my dorkiness. And I also had a speech impediment going on. I couldn't <laughs> talk when I was younger at all. So you've overcome a lot. Yeah, I guess you could say so. And the other trauma we won't talk about. But you know what I mean? It was just, it's just having a black mother. It's just, just having a black mother. I got a Mexican mom. I get it. Yeah. They're and, very uh, strong with their opinions. Yes, and I'm <laughs> just as strong, too. You gave birth to me. You know what I'm saying? You shouldn't want me to be weak-minded anyway. So, but I think that I want people to know that I helped so many women gain confidence in themselves in however that looks. Like, there's women who don't know how to walk in heels, you know, and that's, like, core to being a woman. So we was, we don't know how to do that. So I want to be able to have the legacy that I help women gain confidence in 
so many different ways. And for me, that's what the pageant is doing. And I also give out money for my pageants, too. Ah, so I just want to be able to just, like, help people kind of find some self-esteem and let them know that they are powerful beyond measure. And that I have, I want to, my goal is to be the youngest black EGOT winner. And I have, um, I think, 12 years to accomplish that. 12 years. So, yes, I think. But Haley Bailey may be on the track. Or her, H-E-R, the singer, she's almost her, close to. She's yeah, amazing. She's close to getting her EGOT. So. It may cut it shorter. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not close to there. But they. But just know. Yeah. like, it, Yeah. No matter what you do and don't do, it's it's literally the journey of doing it that it is, is the, the most beautiful thing. I like that. I, I've come to really understand that because I, I used to be very hard-headed about, I want this, I want that, I want that. And it caused me a lot of anxiety. It caused me a lot of frustration, depression, all that. Mm. And what I've come to actually really accept the beauty of my journey, the story, the, the telling of it yeah. is so gorgeous. Like, there's just so much in the beauty of missteps, the it beauty is. of errors, the beauty of figuring out who you are. And at the end of the day, you look back like, oh, I did that shit. Yes. Yes. You know what I mean? And I think that's kind of what I wanted to look back and be like, I did so much. I just want to do so much because the world, like, life is so short and I see death and destruction every day. Yeah, so I want to be able to like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to like live to the fullest in so many different capacities. Just yeah. don't burn yourself out. I'm not gonna burn myself out. Nah, that's what everybody says before they burn <laughs> themselves out. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, there's plenty of time to be burnt out when I get cremated. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not worried about it. I mean, honestly, I do do self care. I don't. I don't ever feel like I'm missing out on something. I really do take my time and recharge. I really do. I feel like that's important. And it allows me to do more. So I think that's what my legacy to be. I want to be known for being a creative person and putting out some amazing pieces of content from movies to my news stories. But that I was able to tell these local stories or hidden stories. I think that's, yeah, that's my I answer. I like that. All right. Mm-hmm. With Thank a... You. With all that said, it's been another episode of the KZ Community Beat. I'm your host, Ross Martinez. My guest this week in the hot seat, Brett Brooks. A lot of different hats, but let's surmise it very simple. Somebody who is extremely creative, somebody that wants to spread beauty, knowledge, and uncovering mysteries in this world. I like that. Love yes. And boost, and boost self-esteem. That's the point. Hire me to write bios. I got you. I'll make this happen. I like that. That was pretty good. That was pretty good. It was off the top. You know what I'm talking about? Um, all right. Thank go. you for having me, too. No, of course, B. I appreciate you coming down and make this happen. We just met outside like, hey, we're going to do this? Let's yes. do this. Come yes. on. That's what happens. I, I, that's Peoria for you. Like, pretty it's much. Just that was like 48 that. hours ago. Yeah. 72 hours ago. Something like that. I don't know. Numbers. <laughs> I'm not good. Actually, you know what? The funny thing is they made me a math tutor in grade school, and I had straight C's. So oh my gosh. look at that. Exactly. Go back and watch all the other uh, – go back and listen to all the other episodes. Make sure you check out B on all her social media platforms, which is The Brett Brooks. The Brett Brooks. Uh, if you don't, I'll put water in your mascara. All right. Peace out. <laughs> <laughs>